Which would you say is better, steel or wood? Now, wood is certainly cheaper. In fact, it's both cheaper to purchase as a raw material as well as to cut and manipulate a shape. But what about things like rigidity? Isn't steel more rigid than wood? Well, there are two variables that determine how stiff a structure will be when a load is placed on it, and steel is only better than wood at just one of those. It turns out if I manipulate the second variable in favor of wood, it's just as good or even better than steel. Let me show you. Here you can see I have a piece of steel which is approximately 17 inches overhung. It's about three millimeters thick or just under an eighth of an inch. And here I have a large mass that I'm gonna place on the end. And you can see we have a pretty significant deflection here. In fact, I can make it more apparent by doing this. And you can see how much it's bowed over. And now we have our piece of wood, which is also overhung by 17 inches. I'm gonna take the same load and place it here at the end. And as you can see, there's almost no deflection at all. So little, in fact, I'm not gonna show you a level, but you get the idea. Now, nearly everyone watching this video will recognize this iconic engineered shape. The key thing I want you to recognize here is that these guys have exactly the same cross-sectional area. The biggest difference is I have rearranged the material in the wood to maximize something called the moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is basically a measure of how stiff a particular geometry will be when a load is placed on it. There's a great video on YouTube that explains the I-beams geometry and why it's shaped the way it is. So if you want to see that, I'll put a link up here as well as a link in the description. It's made by Real Engineering, so I think you'll enjoy it. The important lesson here is that geometry is just as important as material. And when you are looking at your projects that have failed, you have two things to consider, right? One, it could be that you need a stronger material, but it also might mean you need to reconsider your geometry. Speaking of materials, I do want to point out something important here. You should notice that I didn't say that the wood would be as strong as the steel, but that it could be made as rigid as steel when given the advantage in geometry. And that brings me to my second point, which is rigidity and strength, although they often come together, are not the same thing. You can have a material like rubber, for example, which is has almost no rigidity at all, but it can be very high in strength, right? But when you're selecting a material, you do want to be aware that there are also materials which are very rigid and stiff, but don't necessarily have the strength. My kids have assured me, by the way, that pretzels make a very good building material. That brings up a couple of important points here. If you're doing something fairly artistic, you're working with glass, which is a very brittle material, you want to be aware that the rest of your structure needs to be very rigid. Because if you are bending or flexing the glass at all, it's not going to give very much before it simply breaks. But let's say you're not working with glass. Let's say you are working with a ductile material like steel. Uh, steel will bend, and if it's bending more than you want, you might be tempted to buy one of the higher grades of steel, something that's really strong. But unfortunately, all steels have basically the same modulus of elasticity, that is, how flexible the steel is. So you'd be really disappointed to buy this high grade of steel only to see that it bends exactly the same amount. The same rules apply to wood as well. Different species of wood will have varying amounts of flexibility as well as strength. And so it's good to look these numbers up, see not only how the strength of the various species of wood compare, but also how their modulus of elasticity compares. And you don't need a calculator and you don't need to be an engineer to figure this out. You just need to put the numbers side by side and see which one is greater. And that's gonna give you an idea if you change from one wood to the other, whether that new wood is gonna be more flexible or stiffer. The next thing I wanna to talk to you about is triangles. Triangles are your friend. If you take a look over here, you'll see just about any engineered structure you look at implements triangular shapes. Again, you don't need a calculator for this. You just need to implement some simple concepts. So I've got two structures. 
that I've made. One with a simple triangle on the inside and one with a more traditional gusset style that we see many DIYers use. I'm gonna bend both of these structures and show you the difference that it makes. By the way, this one has 9% more material than this one. Here I have another test rig for you. In the back, you can see that the back end won't be allowed to pivot, but the front will be allowed to pivot on this pin here. I'm gonna create myself a little bit of leverage so I don't have to use a lot of weight. And using our same weight from earlier, I want you to notice how much deflection we have there. We're looking at about two centimeters. All right, let's give it the same load. And here we have a deflection of, you know, 0.8 centimeters approximately. Maybe you can see that number better than me, but you can tell it's significantly different. But you get the idea. All right, let's talk about loads real quick for a moment. Step on the other side. And I'm gonna use my I-beam as an example. So let's say I have my structure built, say it's a dresser or whatever. Most of the time we tend to think of our bills as standing under its own weight. It's gonna be fairly stationary and it needs to be able to stand up and maybe handle the weight of items placed directly on top of it. But what happens if somebody leans against your dresser that you just built? Will it be able to withstand that? The point is it's important to think about all the loads that might be acting on your structure. So let's clamp this guy down. And now, since I mostly build machines, let's drop a motor to this guy. And there we go. Now, under this design, it's adequately strong enough to support the weight of my motor. And as long as I don't turn this guy on, it's gonna be fine. But what happens when I turn the motor on? Well, it's gonna create a new force belt pull, which is going in that direction. And it's gonna make the motor wanna twist like this. Well, if it's adequately bolted to this guy, my whole beam is gonna flex. And so again, it's more important to think about which force is gonna be greatest, and that's the direction you wanna put the greatest amount of depth. So in this case, I might actually make my structure like this. Using the same geometry, I was able to create much more stiffness in the direction of the greatest load. So this is important to think about with all of your DIY projects. Think about the highest possible load and how you're gonna counteract that. And don't always focus all of your strength in the direction of gravity because gravity may not be the greatest load your project will experience. All right, bonus tip for you. I've shown you lots of examples of overhung loads, which is you have support over here and then you have an unsupported span and your load is applied out here at the end. But this is actually something you should avoid at all costs, although I see it all the time in many of the DIY projects that I see online. You can simply avoid this by adding a triangular gusset right here or shortening that overhung length and adding your gusset or changing your design altogether and making it fully supported. So this is something that you wanna be thinking about. Always keep your eyes out for that diving board. Even though this is nice and deep, you should think of every overhung load as a diving board. Do you want that? And how do you avoid it? And when it's absolutely required, you do something like this to prevent the deflection. For those of you who don't know, this video is a part of a series that I've been working on where I'm talking about applying engineering concepts to all kinds of DIY level projects. And in the last video, you saw me working on this prototype where we developed this guy as sort of a dual workbench. Now, if you wanna know more about this, you need to watch the first video. But I do wanna give those who have been following a quick update on the workbench. I listened to your feedback and quite a few of you asked if there was a way to keep both benches horizontal instead of having one rotate and having to be cleared off but it was really important to me that I didn't have a bench that opened out into the workspace. I just did not want to occupy any more space in the shop. And so the footprint was critical. But then I started thinking vertically 
And I thought, what if the benches moved up and down vertically? So let me show you a digital prototype of what I have in mind. And we'll talk more about that in the next episode. Here you can see a really rough version of what I have in mind. This workbench will have two surfaces which will move uh, parallel with each other. There will be a tool board in the back. This whole structure will be able to roll around. And right now I'm thinking about it in terms of like square tube type columns. And again, some of these components could be made out of steel in the end, but right now I'm designing it in wood. And this is again, just a rough prototype of what I wanna do. There's gonna be a shop made jack, which will raise and lower these systems with a small motor. And this will allow me to elevate and lower both benches by pushing a button. And again, I'll be able to put it at exactly the height that I want. So I'm really excited about where this is going. This is probably gonna end up costing more than the first design. So I gotta think through how I wanna budget this guy, but I'm pretty excited about where it's gonna go. And it's a fun project so far. So thank you for your input and thank you for challenging me to think a little bit harder and come up with something even cooler, I think. So if you know someone working on DIY projects, whether they are putting shelves in the closet or making power tools like I do, share this video with them and maybe we can save them some of the headaches and pains that come with making mistakes. Anyway, thanks for watching. We're gonna call this bonus footage. I wanted to show you my shop made lathe, which is made almost entirely out of wood, as you can see. It's powered by a DC treadmill motor. And there are just a few areas where I've added metal. This is aluminum, aluminum, and of course, some of these items are steel. But that allows me to get the high density of strength in just the areas that I need it. And then the wood structure uh, is still stiff enough to do the job. In fact, this base here has a double I-beam structure. And you can see that in the picture that I'm going to put up here on the screen for you. It's powered by a DC motor from a treadmill. And it works great. I've been really happy with this project. So I just wanted to show you I practice what I preach. This is a good implementation of using cheap materials where, where it helped and then uh, adding steel where it made a difference uh, as far as its size and whatnot. Thanks for watching.